All right. Well, thank you, Josh. Thank you all for singing. It was uh, wonderful. I enjoy sometimes just listening. Uh, but uh, praise the Lord. Take your Bible tonight, if you would, and open the book of 1 Timothy and chapter number 3. 1 Timothy chapter number 3. As you're turning there, I want to tell you what we're going to undertake tonight. Because once again, it's going to be a message, not that we stay necessarily in a text, but we're going to do some real study. We're going to move around. If, uh, if in turning from passage to passage tonight, uh, it, it's, uh, it's difficult to keep up, please write them down. You should probably come to church always equipped with paper and pencil so you can write things down that you want to remember or have a question. But tonight we're going to try to, to fill in, let's say, the umbrella that we began to build this morning. So we described the, uh, the biblical truth of pastoring that a, that a sh or shepherding a shepherd. Uh, you know, everything in a sheep's life depends upon their shepherd. And the shepherd uh, operates according to his nature, right? So certain things that a shepherd does, he does because of who he is, okay? And um, certain things a shepherd does because of who he is, he desires to meet the needs of his flock or his sheep that he cares for. So we uh, looked at that and we understood that Jesus, uh, that really God established in the very beginning the principle of shepherd and under shepherd, right? And uh, we see it in the book of Genesis. We see it in uh, the historical books. We read a couple of passages today. But the idea of God being the great shepherd, Christ being the good and the great shepherd, uh, and then uh, choosing under shepherds, right, to lead and feed and care for his people on earth uh, is something that God established. It's, n it's not the practice uh, uh, made up of men, but it's what God established. And so uh, we uh, saw Jesus uh, himself, the good shepherd. We also saw that men are called, you know, uh, take uh, heed therefore how you uh, take uh, oversight of the flock of which God hath made you overseers, all right? And so we do have this, the great shepherd, let's say the perfect shepherd, amen, which is God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. And then, of course, God has chosen and uses under shepherds, okay, to, uh, to uh, lead and care for and accomplish, really, his purpose of shepherding in the lives of his people. You should know this, that uh, there are such things as miracles, okay? Uh, miracles are where, you know, God does things, really, where he kind of suspends the natural way, okay? So, uh, make sure we get this. The laws of, quote, nature are really the laws of God, okay? Uh, the creator of this uni universe is the one who made it routinely work the way it works. And the reason scientists can be scientists is because the universe works routinely as if it were put in motion by someone who had a design, okay? And that's, uh, that tends to it. So gravity is a law of God. Say, so why did God make that law? I suppose so you didn't float up into outer space and explode. I mean, I think that's what would happen to you if you went too high, wouldn't it? And you didn't have on one of those Houston, we have landed things. I don't know, but uh, you, I think you would blow up. I think it's pretty good that we have the law of gravity. Amen? I don't like it when I'm uh, on top of my trailer roof doing things. I'd like to suspend the law of gravity for a few moments, but, uh, but it's just there, and it's there because of God. So God uses, uh, there's a point to this, God uses means to accomplish his work. Now, in miracles, God sort of suspends some of those things for a moment and supernaturally intervenes, okay? So God uses the means of the relationship between a husband and wife to create the next generation. Isn't that right? It's just the means. It's not, uh, it's not something we designed, all right? It's not something we could ever make happen. God made that the way, the process of things. But in the case of Jesus, God stepped into that, didn't he? And he intervened. He suspended for a moment the requirement of the law of, of procreation in humanity so that he could uh, stop the, the, the flow of sin from father to offspring and he could create in human form God himself who is now sufficient as the spotless lamb without blemish to pay the price of our sacrifice, okay? So God uses means, and there are times that God steps in at his own sovereign choice and suspends them to accomplish something miraculously or supernaturally, okay? Say, preacher, does God still do miracles? Um, yeah, he does. 
I don't think that we can always go like, wow, that was a miracle. No, it was the little tracker on your phone. That's why you found the keys. But um, <laughs> So, listen, I know that even in the New Testament and the Old, in the Old there were miracles done, right? Uh, God used men to do those miracles, didn't he? In the New Testament, when Jesus was here, Jesus did lots of miracles, and they didn't, the people observing it often didn't get it. So, you know, be careful that you don't say God doesn't do miracles today because God can and I believe does, okay? God doesn't do miracles at your demand, okay? So you can't say this, here's a miracle at my demand, be healed. You're no longer weird or whatever, you know. Yeah. <laughs> You've been su supernaturally cleansed, okay? No, no, God's going to have to take you through a process, all right? But... Uh, Sorry, I <laughs> Sorry, Matthew, you know I love you, but. So, God is this great shepherd, and the act of shepherding towards his people, he does not do that miraculously, he does that through means. And that means is men, people that he puts in that place. He, in fact, established this, as we've seen, and even greater than we looked at this morning. For instance, we didn't talk anything about the role of a father, but the role of a father is the role of a shepherd in his family. Everything that the shepherd does to the sheep, a father is to be doing towards his children. There's no, there's no like line between them. A father's a shepherd. Could I say this? A mother is a shepherd to a degree, isn't she? Mothers fulfill part of that role of shepherding. So I'm just telling you this so I can explain where we're going. But God uses means. So we can enjoy and should the truth about the good shepherd and that the Lord is my shepherd. Thank God for that. Amen. And we can understand that God has under shepherds and he established that. I say thank God for that. What we need to understand is that the under shepherding is done by men whom God mm, chooses or directs. And that means that he has the right to establish certain requirements of character and activity so that these under shepherds are now doing the work of the shepherd in the way of the good shepherd. Is everybody with me here? So the Bible is full of clear instruction to us as to what kind of a man should be shepherding a church or pastoring a church. And it gives us, as we'll see momentarily, the qualifications of that man personally, the duties of that man, it describes the office of the shepherd and the responsibilities to the church. It also describes the responsibilities of the church to the shepherd. Because this is a two-way relationship between shepherd and sheep. All right. 1 Timothy chapter 3. If you'd stand with me in honor of the word of God. So we're going to read a few verses here. And then we're going to flip over to the book of Titus. I'll tell you when. It's right next door. And read some more. Verse number one. This is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. A bishop then must be blameless. The husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine, no striker, not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous, one that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without 
lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Now verse 8 goes on to describe very similar qualifications, the next few verses, for the office of deacon. We're not looking at that office tonight, but they are here. Now flip up a page or two in your Bible to the book of Titus and chapter number 1. And we're going to read another list, which is almost precisely the same. They are parallel passages. These are two letters written to two men who were out uh, ministering to, planting and growing and dealing with churches. Titus is on the island of Crete. And he's told here to go and to ordain elders, right? To put in place pastors over the church that are being formed. And so now in chapter 1 and verse number 5, we have some of those qualifications. For this cause left I thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting, and ordain elders in every city as I had appointed thee. If any be blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of riot or unruly, for a bishop must be blameless as the steward of God, not self-willed, not soon angry, not given to wine, no striker, not given to filthy lucre, but a lover of hospitality, a lover of good men, sober, just, holy, temperate, holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. And so there we have in those two passages these lists, which are greatly the same, a few singular differences uh, that describe the nature of the one who God would use as a means to shepherd his people in the flock of the local church. Let's pray. Father, thank you for our time. I pray that you would help us. I pray, God, that you would teach us, that you would uh, be honored by our response to you. You are the great shepherd Father, and your son is the good shepherd who gives his life for the sheep. He himself, as you and him are one, is the great shepherd. And it is, Lord, our privilege to have you place amongst us men that you would use to shepherd our lives as the sheep of your pasture. Lord, help us to be right with them, right with you, and deliberately careful in finding and following the one you choose to be the shepherd in our life in this time. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for standing tonight, and please be seated. So I know we have something to do right after church, and I know that we're already well into our time, so I'm going to uh, give you some of these things that I'm sure most of you know, but I'm going to give them to you very uh, clear terms. The office of pastor is defined by the terms that are used to call it out in Scripture. And there are three terms that we find that describe the office of pastor. Now, hear me clearly. We have no belief at all that these three terms are separate offices that all uh, function separately within the body. These describe the single office of pastor, okay? And those three terms are these. Um, uh, they are elder, an elder speaks to the dignity or maturity and, uh, uh, let's say, the, the weightiness. And it was generally, and still is to a degree, used to describe an older person, right? So generally, if you go to a senior citizen's home, you find what kind of people there? Okay, you just said this to me. <laughs> and I enjoyed it, but I didn't understand it. Elderly, thank you very much. He who speaketh with a clear voice. Yes, praise the Lord. We go there and we find elderly. And why do we call them or some of you even, maybe even me? Uh, oh. <laughs> that was a slip of the tongue. Uh, why do we call them elderly? I like the way that was said last, older. Some people over here just said old. And, you know... I, Tom, I don't think you have to take that. I think you might be the oldest guy in the room. You are the elder here, hallelujah, uh, in that regard. But um, anyways, so the elder describes really the nature, doesn't it? The sort of character or the trait of this one who would fill this office. The second term we read is bishop. And bishop is a word that means overseer. One who oversees the work and ministry of the church. And, and again, God has always used men to do that. It's a part of the means. And then the third term is pastor, which means shepherd. 
Now, those three, those three things, that activity of an overseer, the activity of a shepherd, and, the, and the, I'd say the activity and the character of an elder, they describe the, the one that God uses to accomplish the means of shepherding. In fact, I would tell you this, that shepherds are to be elders, okay, or men of maturity, right? It doesn't mean they have to be old, uh, but they have to be men of maturity. And in fact, we read this in the list of qualifications when it says, not a novice. Okay, that means not someone who's just started out in the faith, but someone who's mature in the faith. Isn't that right? It's not a year thing. It's not an age thing. It's a maturity thing. But a shepherd is to be an elder who both oversees and feeds the flock. In fact, uh, the bishop is the overseeing work of the shepherd. Okay, so these aren't separate things. Uh, religion has made them shepherd uh, different, right? They put elders, as uh, they would say, their term, not mine, laymen in a church, and bishops that rule over uh, areas, right? And then uh, uh, they have uh, pastors who generally are somewhere in between the elders and the, and the bishops in their hierarchical structure. But we don't believe in any of that because what the Bible does, and we read it in First Peter, is it really uses those terms interchangeably depending on the part of the office that he's describing. And so he tells elders, elders to take oversight of the flock and to feed the flock in 1 Peter chapter 5. All three of those terms are there together describing the exercise of one office, the office of pastor. And so the office is defined by the terms that God uses to describe its functions and nature. Okay, So really, I think, pretty simple. So that's the office. And the offer, office is an office that God let's say, tends to or directs men into, okay? So God gets to choose who would fill the office of pastor, okay? And so we, we call it a call. I want you to be careful with the word, the call of God, because sometimes it's greatly abused these days. So the call of God is not a license to do what you want to do, okay? It is really an invitation to serve God in a particular place or way. Does everybody understand that? And, and so uh, he makes it clear that, in, in fact, where we read in 1 Timothy, that it's okay for a man to desire the office of a bishop, right? Bishop, one of the roles or that overseeing role, and that a man who would desire it desires a good thing. So uh, it's not a good idea for you to have the idea that, uh, and I've heard this, in fact, I had a man in the church, we were in Colorado some years ago, uh, kind of trying to get going again, but, uh, but he used to say this, I just always wanted to preach, but God wouldn't let me. Well, I think that if you really have a desire to be used as an under-shepherd and are willing to take on the attributes that God, and requirements that God has for you, that God would be pleased to use you as an under-shepherd, right? So it's not a, it's, it's not so supernatural that really anyone who will, and I believe that has some spiritual gifts to that uh, end, would be uh, you know, disqualified from. If a man desireth the office of a bishop, he desireth a good thing. And could I say this to you, uh, man? If you believe and desire to be the pastor of a church someday, that's a good thing you desire. Your job now is to, is to develop a life where you're, uh, where you're uh, able, where you meet the qualifications and the abilities to be responsible for the task of the shepherd or of the pastor. But don't say this, well, I don't know, I mean, uh, and I've heard this, that's why I'm saying it. Well, I, I really wanted to do something for God, but I just never felt anything. Okay, I'm glad you didn't. I'm just here to tell you that the Bible says, if a man desireth the office of a bishop, he desireth a good thing. Does that mean everyone's qualified? Nah. Does that mean everyone has that gift? Nah. But I believe that desire is where it begins and then we walk forward with God to see whether we do, in fact, meet the qualifications of Scripture and have the spiritual gifts or abilities in order to do that work. Everybody with me here? So, so yeah, we talk about the call of a pastor, and clearly there is the making of a person to fill that role. In fact, if you would uh, go quickly with me, we've been there. In fact, you're in 1 Timothy. Go to 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse number 12. 
First Timothy chapter one and verse 12, it says, and I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who hath enabled me for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. Check this out. He said, you know what? I wanted to serve God. He enabled me because he found my character to be faithful. Can I tell you that when you would, when you would desire the office of a bishop, men, and uh, you would uh, determine to live a life faithful to the requirements, God is perfectly able to enable you and put you into the ministry. Amen? And that's really what many would call the call of God. Now, uh, saying that, when we make the idea of a call of God just something supernatural that happens right after we eat pepperoni mixed with Swiss cheese, when we make it that, when we make it that, we end up with men trying to be under shepherds that weren't put there by God. And while they may have some natural abilities, at the end of the day, because it's not really God's work, it becomes very difficult, doesn't it? Because God uh, put him in the ministry and made him able for the ministry. So the, the call of the pastor. Where I really want to spend the bulk of our time, not all of it, but the bulk of it, is on these lists that we read in these two chapters. And I want to just walk down this list with you quickly and talk to you about the qualifications for a pastor. Now this is very serious business. Here's why. We could have a young man either being prepared perhaps to be a pastor or even that would uh, become the pastor potential of our church who's not quite as good of an administrator as another guy. Doesn't have the experience, right? Or maybe he's not quite as eloquent or handsome as you know, your interim pastor is. Sorry, but my wife told me to say that. <laughs> and it's possible, isn't it, that he would meet these qualifications and that he would grow in knowledge in that office. In fact, let me tell you a little secret about every pastor you've ever heard preach. When they started, they preached messages that they would later call heretical. Or they'd say it like this, I preached that. In fact, I can tell you that I started, and a few years later, I kept all of these sermon manuscripts in a file, because I knew they were gold, okay? And then I thought, you know, I'm gonna go back to some of them, and uh, you know, when we'd moved, and I'm gonna do some of those series again. And I got the notes out, and I went like, oh! What is this? I felt like I needed to call the church up and go, hey, listen, uh, I'm sorry. That's all. I'm sorry. <laughs> Please forgive me and uh, only take the stuff that is in the Bible from what I said. All the rest of it, junk. <laughs> it's possible that a man can grow. So these qualifications are really the sine qua non, right, as they say, or the, the thing without which none of the rest is possible. Uh, a man could be a gifted orator, but not have the qualifications of an elder or a shepherd, and even though he's a good speaker, not be qualified for the office of under-shepherds. Everybody got that? So we want to be careful as we look at a pastor and finding a pastor that we have more than stars in our eyes. Okay? Uh, we were going through this years ago. I was on the pulpit committee. I didn't know anything then either, just so you know. But, um, but uh, we had these men coming before us. And to be honest with you, if I were there today, I'd say, stop. We're doing this all crazy and backwards. And what would happen is they'd bring three pastors in, right? And they would preach. And then we'd sit down and say, well, I like that guy. He was funny. Literally, I like that guy. He's a great storyteller. I didn't like that guy, he's, you know, he, whatever. And we're just comparing men against men. And what we're doing is looking at all the wrong things. Because at the heart of this, it's that a man desire the office of a bishop, and he finds himself biblically qualified according to these qualifications. Everybody with me here? Now, does he need to be able to preach? It's part of his duty to feed the flock. Right? Does he need to be able to oversee? Well, I mean, he fills the office of a bishop, of course. But the specific knowledge in those things will grow, assuming that we have the foundation of qualification. Okay. So let's go through them real quick. And I'm just going to read off my notes. We've already read the list. 
And I'm going to go through them quickly, and there's only a handful. Number one, blameless. That a bishop um, must be blameless. It's the top of the list in 1 Timothy. And it means this, that, that there's no reason for accusation in his life. That he doesn't conduct himself in such a way that he opens himself to accusation. Whether it be in morals or finances, in conduct or character, or even, to a great degree, in the teaching of the Word of God. That when you would hear an accusation made uh, against uh, your under-shepherd, you would say this, no way. Because he doesn't live a life that's open to that. There will always be accusations made. Charles Spurgeon said it, I've probably told it to you, but he said, neither listen to your greatest fan or your biggest critic when you're in the foyer of the church. You're not nearly as bad as your biggest critic says you are, so remember that. And you're not nearly as good as your biggest fan thinks you are. Remember that. Okay? That as a pastor, you should listen to neither. Well, the truth is, is that there will be people who cast accusation at the feet of a pastor or an elder or bishop, all one office. The question is, is does he live a life that's blameless? Okay, not are there false accusations that can be tossed, but is he blameless? Where there's really no reason for the accusation in any area of his life. A bishop must be blameless. Please maybe underline the words must be, and then you could circle the word blameless. Because all three of those words are important, and the must be really applies to everything that follows on that list, not simply that qualification. So he must be blameless. He must be the husband of one wife. Next qualification. So a bishop must be blameless. A husband of one wife. Matthew 19, verses 4 through 9. You could turn there. We're not going to. It's when they're uh, quizzing Jesus about the issue of divorce. And he uh, speaks to them and uh, says that when, uh, you know, the issues of adultery that can exist there for sure. And he says this. Listen, uh, a bishop here, a pastor, must be the husband of one wife. Please don't make that just one wife at a time and believing that you have license to run through wives at your will. That's really what Jesus was uh, uh, dealing with and what Moses was dealing with was people who were just like, ah, you know what? I'm really tired of my wife's eggs, Benedict. I need a new wife. For any reason, Moses said. But here it says that there's to be, that there's to be a faithfulness in the marital relationship. Amen. Do we understand tonight, church, that marriages get broken and they're not always both members' fault? No one is perfect, but marriages get broken. So if you've had a broken marriage, are you damaged goods? Much silence. Let me give you a resounding answer. No way. The blood of Christ is sufficient. But here he says this, that there is a necessity of an enduring nature of those things and that you must be the husband of one wife. Here's the third one, vigilant. Vigilant means to be wise, cautious, circumspect, temperate, in word, in relationships, and in counseling. I read a story of... um, uh, Graham, Billy Graham, and this has been picked up by many over the years, but he refused to ever be in a situation where he was alone one-on-one with a woman that wasn't his wife. So he wouldn't ride in a car with one, he wouldn't eat at a restaurant, you know, he'd say, well, that's public, yep, but you know what that looks like there by that walks in, right? When Bo and I are sitting down having breakfast together, people look and go, oh, that's a, that's a plate full of ugly, I wouldn't want to be with those two, right? <laughs> No, I meant, <laughs> Bo, you're the beautiful part, man. That's, that's just, uh, you're a beautiful man, Bo, just so you know. But you feel better now? <laughs> Let's all pray. <laughs> you understand the point. Let me tell you what he's being. He's being vigilant, Right? He was being circumspect, wise, so that he really would. Vigilance is really a part of living blameless, isn't it? 
And so it's a requirement. When, when someone would claim or desire the office of an under-shepherd, and yet their life is not being you know, lived in this wise, cautious, circumspect, temperate, in word, relationship, counseling, indeed, uh, listen, what they've done is disqualified themselves. Again, they might be great people, and they might be great speakers, but as long as this lack of vigilance exists in their character, they're not qualified to be an under-shepherd for the good shepherd. Isn't that right? Vigilant, sober is the next one. Self-controlled of passions and emotions. Uh, I'll give you just some scripture. I won't turn to it. Ecclesiastes 7 verse 9 and uh, Proverbs chapter 25 and verse 28. I believe that one says that, that, you know, a man that doesn't have control of his passion is like a city with broken down walls. A city with broken down walls means that they're susceptible to being defeated by any enemy that comes along. And when a man doesn't have some sobriety, that he's constantly ruled by emotions, and they can swing, really. I mean, you've met people who go from anger to I love you, man, and, and uh, uh, whatever it is. But that, that lack of sobriety really disqualifies a man from representing as under-shepherd the great shepherd, doesn't it? Because there's a lack, a demonstrated lack of spiritual and emotional maturity and a disqualification for the office, sober. The next one is of good behavior. Courteous and polite in relationships, not slovenly in appearance. Means that, I guess what it says, that a man that would fill the office of under shepherd should not be a jerk. Can I say it that way? That he should be courteous and polite in relationships. Whether he knows you or not, whether he's getting something from you or not, and whether you made the right change for him at the store or not. That in every relationship, he should be of good behavior, mannerly, gentlemanly, right? Uh, courteous and polite. Hospitality. Uh, an eagerness to receive those uh, who need help and those who are, I'm getting an echo here, guys. Is that me or you? Or I don't know. And those who are um, in the body, there should be hospitality exercised amongst us, both inwardly and outwardly. We exercise hospitality. Let me tell you how you've done it in the last few months. When Jimmy Carter was here, you exercised hospitality toward him. When Galen and Andrea were here, you exercised hospitality. Thank you. I thanked you at the time. But those things are required in the nature of a shepherd or under-shepherd, of given to hospitality. Apt to teach is the next one. And I think that, that many of these things don't need definition. I think we know that apt to teach means ready, prepared, and likely, right? Or given to teaching. So someone that, that wants the truth to be taught. Someone that prepares themselves, right? So no one was born um, outside of Jesus who knows all of the Bible, okay? And able to, like, explain to you some of the, um, let's say, finer intricacies of Bible doctrine. That requires preparation. But a man that is apt to teach is diligent to prepare. A man that's not diligent to prepare is not apt to teach. Some years ago, we were uh, in a meeting in a church and there was, uh, the pastor had been there some time. He wanted to move on for whatever reason. And um, he had a man there that he was uh, training, I put that in air quotes, to be the pastor. So I talked to the pastor about how he's doing it, interested and wanted to know if we could be helpful in some way. And so he told me some things and then he arranged it that my wife and I had dinner at this man and his wife's house later that week. And so I sat down at dinner and we're talking and I said, so tell me about your study. How's it coming? He had him working on a particular course of study uh, to, to get, let's say, grounded in some theologies and doctrines and all appropriate stuff. And he goes, oh, well, to be honest with you, preacher, it's not coming good at all. And I said, well, why not? I mean, what, what, what's, what's wrong? What's, what's hindering you? He goes, well, I mean, I get home from work. I sit down on the couch. I eat dinner. I don't feel like studying. I said, every day? Yeah. I said, well, let me help you with this. If you believe for a second that you have any right to stand in a pulpit, that is not apt to teach. And if, if truly God is trying to put you into the ministry, God needs you to do your part, which is the diligent preparation, which is, a, which is an essential component of the phrase apt to teach, okay? 
So a person who doesn't prepare themselves but pr- tries to preach, what would we call them? Huh? Did you say pride? Or oh, fraud? Yeah, maybe, maybe, Scott, yeah. You know, certainly be acting it, especially if they said, I've labored. Uh, in fact, I know it's not, this is good, though, you'll want to hear it. We were traveling across Wyoming. We stopped in a church still there. I won't tell you the name of it. Someone had recommended that they were looking for some help, and we might stop by. We were on vacation, stopped in. And the pastor walked up, and uh, he said, I've been up all night. I've been up all night. I've labored over this passage, and I've got a burning message in my bosom from God. And I'm thinking, yeah. I need a burning message. And he goes, we open the text, he starts talking. So we read a verse, and he talked. There was no study. And as he was talking, he went like this. Oh, wow, God just showed me that. I didn't see that ever before. And started writing things down in his Bible about what it meant. And this is what I did. I went, okay, close my Bible. Can we go now? This is he was not being honest with God. So he wasn't apt to teach because he wasn't diligent to prepare. Right? So a man has to be apt to teach. Ready, willing, desiring, and prepared. Apt to teach. The next one is this, um, not given to wine. I don't know that I need to say much, but strong drink is a mocker, the Bible says. And the whole process, uh, you know, uh, we have a, a, a big movement of social drinking amongst uh, Baptists these days. And uh, I'm, not here to, uh, uh, I'm not here to tell you anything but the truth, but I just want to tell you this. The process of intoxication, the social drinking movement says, well, as long as I don't get, as long as I don't get drunk, I'm okay. The process of intoxication, that means bringing a toxin into your body, begins at the first drink. And the world even understands this. Because you've heard the public service commercials that say, buzzed drinking is, or buzzed driving is drunk driving. You know what they understand? You don't have to be falling down drunk to be under the control of that toxin or of that, in, uh, uh, that uh, beverage or whatever it is that, that causes you to be under its control. So listen, a nut given to wine. Not uh, needy, uh, not given to wine. Uh, the under shepherd of God uh, should not be one who uh, turns at the end of the day to an intoxicating beverage for the purpose of working his, way, uh, his, uh, his stress out or any other reason. No striker is the next one on the list. A striker is someone who uh, fights. So I really mean this, one who's uh, not quarrelsome or a smiter, okay? Now, I did a little bit of smiting before church tonight. Isn't that right? And, uh, but it was needed. It was the rod of correction applied to the back of the head, okay? Um, but uh, you all are looking at me like crazy. It was just us playing around. Um, but um, it was your son, by the way. Um, yeah. <laughs> He said something about throwing the bulletins in a burn barrel. And I was like, what'd you say? <laughs> a pastor's not to be a fighter. So I don't know if I mentioned this to you this morning, but you never see the sword in the accoutrements of a shepherd. It's never there. The sheep in his testimony of security from the shepherd this morning did not say, thy rod and thy staff and thy sword, they, uh, your, thy sword, they comfort me. He said, your rod and your staff. The instruments of the shepherd were a rod and a staff. When David went out to fight Goliath as a shepherd, he didn't have a sword. He was offered a sword. He didn't take a sword. He didn't take any of the armor because there was not something that was tested that he could use in battle the way he could. So he went out with a sling. That's all. A pastor cannot be a striker. There's uh, really more on this, but not one who's constantly engaging in a brawl or even physical violence or the threat of it, I suppose, is true. Uh, not greedy, okay? Um, I think that is easily to understand. Uh, we already read today that we're to take oversight of, not for filthy lucre's sake. A pastor isn't uh, pastoring, an under-shepherd is not saying, well, what's in this for me and do I get enough out of it to satisfy myself? That's the opposite of this. Should we pay our pastor well? Should we pay our pastor as good as we can? Come on. 
Should we be shorthanded in caring for our pastor and his family? No, we should not. But nor should the pastor have expectations that would, be, that would drive him to greed. I need more and more and more and more and more. It disqualifies him. He's to be patient, gentle, and reasonable. That means this, that when you come into the office and say, or wherever, and you, he's over at your house and say, hey, I have this, past, this problem, or, you know, I'm struggling with something that you've been doing, perhaps, and I'm tripping over a little bit, that, that he wouldn't explode on you. He would be patient. I mean, that's just what the word means, right? What I told you this once, you don't get it? Poor Matthew. Don't go sit in the back. I'll pick on this side next week, okay? <laughs> a pastor or an under-shepherd is required by God to be patient. Long-suffering. Have you ever not gotten something the first time? Second? Third? Have you ever met a guy in the back of the church in the morning, got to the pulpit and forgotten his name? I have. I pray to God that, that they would be patient with me when I do. And the pastor is to be patient. Just God's qualifications. Real quickly here, I want to get uh, through this tonight. He's to be patient. Here's the next one. He's to be not a brawler. Not only is to be not a striker, physically violent, but not a brawler. Can I just throw a 2003-ism in there? That would include social media. A pastor's not a guy that should get on social media. I don't know. I don't have social media because I don't want to hear if they're doing this, to be honest with you. You said, do you have your head in the sand? No, I just want to love the brethren without any problems there. Amen. So I'm not on social media. I don't have Facebook or all that stuff. But, but I don't believe it's Satan. Okay, so you didn't hear that here. Pastor said Facebook is Satan. No, no, no. Pastor didn't say that. I choose not to do it because I want not to have that in my brain. But I would t tell you a man that's a brawler, that's always contentious, right? Um, uh, that you can't hardly get along with, or that is always ready to fight back, or to ridicule, or to mock, or to, uh, and to tear another person down. Uh, that, that man is disqualified, according to this, from the office of under-shepherd. And when you would find it in a shepherd, let's, let's be patient, but let's understand that we would need to have a conversation, wouldn't we, about that? in love, for a purpose, but still a conversation, because a pastor is not to be a brawler. If your pastor's the guy who's always starting the latest fight, either in person or uh, from the pulpit or on social media or wherever, then he is stepping on the lines of qualification for the office of shepherd. And that should be troublesome to us as a church. It says he's not to be covetous, no lover of things or money, goes along with greedy to be one that ruleth well his own house. Verse 5 of 1 Timothy chapter 3 says, because if he can't rule his house or oversee his house, how can he rule or oversee the church? Now, let's be careful. Some people take this to the extreme of saying, well, we had this guy in to be a missionary and, you know, uh, and his kids were completely out of control. Well, I I guarantee you that there's a point where kids are not being uh, brought back into subjection that would disqualify a man because he can't rule his house well. But simply because your two-year-old acts like a two-year-old doesn't disqualify you from the ministry. So we don't really measure a man by the two-year-oldness of his two-year-old. We measure him by his response to caring for and growing his family, don't we? Concerning the qualification. But he must rule his own house well. Um, when his family doesn't come to church, I think there's probably an issue of ruling his family well, or whatever the case might be, that he's to rule his own house well. He's to be a loving husband and father, and in that an example to the church, and he's to lovingly and biblically discipline his children in front of the church as a part of ruling in the right way in front of the church, as a part of ruling over them. Now, could I just give you a personal caution, church? Um, don't put your pastor's children in a fishbowl and stare at them all day long. Love them. Know that they have a lot of burden in their life that other kids don't. Listen, my kids have gone to Sunday school classes when we visited churches and been expected to uh, know all the answers to everything. 
After all, you're the preacher's kids. I'll tell you about my kids. They're great. They don't have all the answers. You know why? Because they're kids. And they're still growing. And when they're 59, they won't have all the answers. They'll just have more than they do when they're 15. Right? Now, if you've achieved the point where you have all the answers, let me know so I can start checking off birthdays when that happens. But let's let a man rule his family well and learn from that and walk with him in that and not simply use it as a lever. Two more qualifications. Not a novice. Immature in the faith and really emotionally immature, I would say, as well. And then last is good report of them which are without. We went to take the church in Jerome, Idaho, and they had one little uh, privately owned gym in town. It was a, you know, it was good. The equipment in there was purchased in the 1950s, I'm fairly certain. But, um, but I went in there, and there was a guy in there. And I, I go early in the morning. And, and uh, so he goes, oh, I've never seen you around before. And that was not uncommon in a small town like that. But I said, oh, yeah, I just moved to town. What do you do? Well, I'm the pastor of Bible Baptist Church. He goes, Bible Baptist Church? I know some people that go there. And it just brought to mind one of the trustees, one of them, just his name. And I mentioned his name. And I said, oh, yeah, you probably know because this guy was in the trades and that guy was in the trades. And I said, you probably know. And he goes, oh, that guy goes to your church? So just imagine if that was the pastor. If the response of the community is, oh, that's your pastor? Then there's a big problem with the testimony of the church because there is not a good report without. Now, listen, every one of us should be seeking a good report without. Amen? But the pastor has a requirement from God that he's careful in his conduct so that outside of the church, they would also say, well, that man's a good man. He was just and fair. And he treated me with respect. And anything less is disqualifying on God's terms, isn't it? Because the requirement of a pastor is that he have a good report without. Is everybody with me? So God gives these requirements for the under-shepherd. Now, what are we trying to do? We're trying to fill up the gap, if you will. Trying to say, yes, God uses men as under-shepherds. He ordained that, but God has some requirements for those men. So that we know how to pray and how to uh, seek the Lord concerning that. And when we would, when we would uh, uh, consider men for the pastorate of our church, it would be important that these qualifications are the first kind of bar. Isn't that right? That before we would say, yeah, we should move to the next step and find out everything they believe, we should have some record, some idea of their character and conduct uh, as, it would, uh, as it would regard these qualifications of Scripture. How do we get that? Well, what we have to do is one of two things. Either... I believe the biblical and preferred method is raise the pastor up from within or the more common method, which is to shoot out invitations, then we would have to have a pretty good ability to talk to people in his past about the kind of character he's demonstrated over the years. And all of that is a part of the diligence of seeking God's direction for an under-shepherd. Is everybody with me here? So we're really running out of time. Let me tell you that the responsibilities of the pastor and the responsibility of the church to the pastor, we're gonna go over them Wednesday night. So come prepared, okay? Because they too are a part of our process. But remember what we're looking at. We're not just setting up a screen where we can uh, look at people and go like, you're not good enough. We're looking for a way to see what God sees. And that is through the, uh, the requirements and the responsibilities that God has given to the office, the means, the man, 
that would shepherd you under him. And so we must know them and look diligently at them. Isn't that right? Not as a way to be above anybody, but as a way to very carefully guard the door so that the one who comes is a shepherd and not a hireling. Because we read about that this morning, didn't we? That when the wolf comes, the hiring, hireling runs. That doesn't always mean move out of town. It means stand aside to a great degree instead of standing between the wolf and the sheep. Everybody understand? This issue of shepherding is so important that God has not only told us it exists, but how we can identify a real under-shepherd in him. I'll tell you what I told you this morning, and we'll close. Each of us need to begin to diligently pray. Armed with the information that we're getting from the word of God, we need to be praying for a man that would meet these qualifications. Don't we? We need to do it together, and we need to do it individually. But you're not shooting in the dark here. God has a very clear set of requirements for a man that would be your under-shepherd. And all you have to do is agree with God as you look at men. Amen? I'm going to have a word of prayer, and I know we're past our time. we got a working clock up there. I hate it. But um, <laughs> it used to be wrong all the time. I was like, ah, it's probably not right, but it's actually working. So I'm going to close this service. We're going to give you a quick break, and then we're going to take any questions uh, regarding the statement of faith. All right? Let's have a word of prayer. Father, thank you for our time tonight. Thank you for your word.